We've been working through this book called Daniel, uh, one of the greatest books of prophecy there is from the Old Testament. As we look at this uh, Old Testament series, I've entitled this a message, Daniel chapter 4, The King's Tree. And it uh, talks about another uh, dream. In fact, we could uh, entitle this book, The Book of Dreams, I think, because of the dreams that are emphasized in there. Uh, and I call this uh, The King's Tree. And this is the second of King Nebuchadnezzar's dreams that he asks Daniel to interpret. What is there about dreams that seems to so consume our lives? You know, we think a lot about dreams. I think they influence us so often in so many ways. Uh, amateur dream interpretation seems to be a popular pastime among uh, many and are trying to figure out what dreams mean uh, can be sometimes frustrating. What is the significance of this dream? Dreams, they occur in our REM sleep, we're told. That means uh, our rapid eye movement, apparently in the deepest part of our sleep where eyes start to twitch. And so in that, uh, that's the time that we dream. We all dream. Some people say, I don't dream. It's just that usually you probably are not remembering your dreams. We all dream whether we remember them or not. According to the National Sleep Foundation, adults dream as many as six dreams per night. That's a lot of activity. You'd have to be wore out by the time you wake up from your dreams, would you not? We had a lady in one of our churches who was a real authority on uh, dreams, or on not so much dreams, but on sleep and sleep studies. And she worked in a sleep study um, department uh, at the local hospital and was really uh, quite a, an expert in the area of studying sleep and seeing when people were dreaming, that kind of thing. Her partner, and I always love to tell this story, her partner that worked with her in the sleep studies uh, came in one evening because they're, you know, you go to work at night when you're in sleep studies. That makes sense? So anyways, so she came in to um, uh, share with her and she said, my husband and I, this is back in Michigan, she said, my husband and I came up with this really cool invention because so many people have sleep apnea. We decided that if we took a piece of Band-Aid and we put a little band on it, and we put it across the nose of a person, it opens up their airways, and they're able to breathe a little better. And so in the process of that, we've decided to patent this and put this out for sale, and you can get all in on this deal for $1,000 on the ground level. And Kathy said, nobody's gonna ever wear no Band-Aid on their nose. That woman no longer works with Kathy. Her and her, and her husband are way over independently wealthy. Who would have ever thought the NFL would have gotten those breathe right strips? And Kathy talks about her friend that she used to know that worked with her about that. We all dream. Dreams are interesting, aren't they? The ancient art of dream interpretation uh, does a lot to have people try to feel better about themselves and what we dream. Most often we dream things of things that are really snippets of disconnected happenings or influences that we've seen or impacted our subconscious throughout any time frame. Sometimes it's in the middle of the day or what we watch on television or what we hear on the radio. It can affect us uh, through a day or later on in the week. A dream can come back to us of something that influenced our lives or something that we saw. It can also be a critical event such as a recent accident or the death of a loved one. People often dream about the loved one after they pass or the birth of a child, or the sickness of someone we love. Uh, they are said to influence uh, those things, uh, influence our dreams. And so we look for significance in dreams. Ever dream of something that seems so very real to you, that you're so into it, and you're holding it in your hands, and you wake up and you go, ah, it's gone. Common dreams happen commonly to everyone. Like the dream that you're falling. They say if you hit, you die, but I haven't had that happen to me yet. Or you can dream of the uh, ability to fly or float uh, without an airplane. Or you can dream, a very common dream that come, occurs to people is that you're naked in a crowd of people. That has not happened to me. That's pretty weird, but they say it's a common dream. Or you dream of, of an alien abduction, and um, that hasn't happened to me either. Dreams can be funny and sometimes dreams can be scary, like codeine dreams, which tells us that there are some substances 
that can affect our dreams. And some of the young people do something called banana dreams. If you want the most scary dreams of your life, eat two bananas right before you go to bed for several days, and you'll find out what banana dreams are all about. You say, why would anybody do that? But people do it all the time, looking for thrills. Dreams are one of the most natural things that take place as a regular part of life. But please, please, do not think every dream has special significance or meaning. Most times, dreams are just dreams. And there are all kinds of snippets and happenings and events that affect our lives. But that being said, we find that in Scripture that God does occasionally speak to people through the use of dreams. And if he did that in the Old Testament, and he did that in the New Testament with people such as Joseph, Jesus' stepfather, then certainly he could speak to us through a dream. We see that in this book of Daniel that we've been walking through, this foreign king, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the greatest kingdom in the known world, who was so incredibly sure that he was in control, and I think that's the key for us in this chapter of four, who was shown that the one true God, our God, that he is in fact in control. A lesson many people today could stand to learn as well. In the case of Nebuchadnezzar, God chose to use dreams to get his attention. And so we enter chapter 4 of this incredible book with a prophecy preserved for us to learn from. Now, we want to look at this passage of Scripture, and I apologize for the length, but we really need to write, read this so that you get within the context of what's taking place, as well as providing opportunity for people online that might be watching this and need to hear this for themselves. Daniel chapter 4 Allow me, please, to read this for you, and you'll see the story of what's taking place. The king, Nebuchadnezzar, is narrating this part of the passage. He writes this himself to the people so they can know who God is, and I think it's really incredible that he does that. So let me read for you. You can follow along either online or in a Bible that you have with you. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. It is my privilege to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that most, the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. I, King Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all of the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. This time he told them the dream. Finally, Daniel came into my presence and I told him the dream. He is called Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. Now you'll see that King Nebuchadnezzar was a polytheist. I said, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods, small g, gods that King Nebuchadnezzar worshipped, is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream, interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was, it was visible to the ends of the earth. The leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it was wild animals, uh, wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in the branches, and every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in bed, I looked, and there before me was a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim off the branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its roots, bound with iron and bronze, remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of the heaven, and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man, 
and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. Now, we'll continue in just a moment, but please allow me to read this again. I think it's really important in this time of elections that we acknowledge this. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. That is a timeless truth, people. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men of my kingdom in my kingdom can interpret it for me. But you can, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time. And his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. I think Daniel knew the temper of this king. Belteshazzar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, provided food for all, giving shelter to the wild animals, and having nesting places in its branches for the birds, your majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky, and your dominion extends the distant parts of the earth. Your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger, coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. This is the interpretation, your majesty, and this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord, the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as a royal residence? by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. Even as the words were on his lips, a voice from heaven came. This is what is decreed to you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately what had been said about King Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Could you imagine that? At the end of that time, I, King Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back His hand or say to Him, What have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, 
My honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Wow. Let's pray. Father, so much we thank you for this passage of Scripture and the incredible story of King Nebuchadnezzar. What a timely message for us to hear uh, concerning someone who is high and lofty as we look even at these next elections, as we hear all of the people tell us the truths and untruths around us, whether local, whether uh, statewide, or whether national, that we are thinking about in this election time, that you, Lord, you appoint rulers over us. And we are taught lessons through their ruler of us. So help us as we look at this passage of Scripture and see some truths that we might find for ourselves today. That we might walk away from this understanding better about our relationship with you, who you are, and how we interact with you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Allow me a quick recap. Daniel chapter 1. I gave you food for thought. I thought that was really funny, and nobody seems to think that's funny at all. I just don't get that. But anyways, Daniel chapter 1, where he was uh, called to eat from the king's table and eat the food that was sacrificed to idols, and Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, how they all uh, were said, no, we won't eat from this food, and they were made actually stronger and clearer thinking on the Daniel diet, thanks to Joan, I now have a book in my house called The Daniel Diet. Lord help me, I think we're headed that way. Wait till you hear those sermons. <laughs> Chapter 2, we talked about a dream come true. The first uh, dream that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar asked Daniel to interpret. The cool thing about that was he says, no, you guys are the smart guys. You tell me what the dream is. Well, tell us what the dream is and we'll interpret it. No, no, you tell me what I dreamed. Can you imagine that? And they Daniel was able to be uh, have it revealed to him by God and was able to uh, reveal it, and he was re rewarded for that. Then we looked at Daniel chapter 3 last week, the very familiar passage to many of you, uh, Shadrach, Shad Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as they were thrown into the fiery furnace. You get this up and down, up and down, up and down of, Zach of King Nebuchadnezzar, as uh, he is uh, for the Lord and then kind of goes off, it's because he believes in many gods. But uh, there, uh, then King Nebuchadnezzar looked into the furnace and saw the four people in the furnace. So he called them out. They walked out and not a hair on their head was even scorched or a, a thread off of their clothing. Absolute miracle that they would not compromise and God would bless them for that. And now chapter 4 in the dream of the king's tree. Written and recorded as the words of King Nebuchadnezzar himself in reflection of what had taken place, and more importantly, why? So allow me to give you a little bit of an overview. You heard the message, you heard the thing. Let me throw in some of my commentary on it, if you don't mind. We find King Nebuchadnezzar was happy and content as the story starts out. His life was full of prosperity. He was living with the left hind leg of a rabbit in his pocket. Things were coming his way. He was looking great and feeling great, living in the palace in the land of luxury, eating from the lavish food of the king's table, saying, it's a good life. Why can't things just go on this way forever? And then the dream, a troubling dream. It scared him absolutely to death with images that terrified the king of the world. This man was the most powerful man in the world over all of the known kingdom, all of the known civilized world. Is there anyone in the kingdom that can interpret this dream for me? I'll even tell you what it was. It haunted him and consumed him. And then we're told the dream. The dream was of a tree, a giant and larger than a redwood, enormous with branches that spread and touched the sky. A tree so large it could be seen all over the entire world, with unimaginable fruit and branches and leaves, providing food for everyone. It's like the most incredible tree ever. And then a holy one came down, possibly an angel, the messenger of God, probably Gabriel, who came along and cut down the tree and stripped the tree of its leaves, destroying the branches and scattering the fruit. However, the stump remains. 
And with the stump was covered with grass and dew, and its mind was changed from a man to an animal for seven time spans. We're really not sure what those time spans were. Years? Seasons? Not sure exactly what they were, but uh, David, or Daniel, tells uh, the king the, the meaning, but as he hears the, uh, per, the, uh, the, uh, the dream, he then uh, panics a little bit, because he knows the way, what this king loved to cut people into little pieces and turn their houses to rubble. So Daniel's a little bit upset and kind of worried about that. He didn't know the best way to share the truth of his interpretation. Daniel knew the king's temper. And so he gives the news to the king as gently as possible. If only the dream were about someone else. But king, sorry to say, the tree is you. You, O king, are strong and mighty, the greatest in the world, but there is even one greater than you, my God, the God above all of your prosperity and wealth and majesty. He is God that's God. My God wants you to know who he is. You're worshiping all these other little gods out there. Focus on him, because he's the only one true God. So you'll be driven from the people and you'll lose your mind. You'll become like an animal, eating dirt and grass and sleeping out in the open. This will continue until you finally acknowledge God as God. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar thought he dodged a bullet there. Twelve months later, his thought the whole thing had passed away without happening. Oh, I wonder how that dream interpreter is doing. Well, that never worked. Guess his interpretation wasn't real. And he was out walking on the rooftop, overseeing all of his kingdom and all that he had accomplished, bragging to himself about his successes and his wealth and his prosperity and all of his earthly things. Oh, well, that sure was a crazy dream I had back there. With the words still on his lips, a voice from heaven comes down declaring the sentence on King Nebuchadnezzar. He lost his mind, became like an animal. He grew long hair, and lived in the wild. He lived off-grid, filthy, unwashed and disgusting, but in nature, and I think there's really a key for us, in the natural world, he saw and discovered God. He saw who God was, and lifts his head towards the heavens in praise of the Most High God, the creator of all the natural world. His sanity was restored. His kingdom is restored. He is returned to the throne and he becomes even greater than he was before. And in this story, we see an excellent story of a right relationship between our God and his people. A right perspective. That they, people, would have nothing in, pro they, would have, 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 they would have everything in proper perspective about who is really in charge and who is not in charge. And I think this is a timely message for us today. So what is it we learn here? Number one, first, if we can step back from what is actually happening and look for the timeless truths that are in this passage of Scripture that speak to all of us, we see that God is the initiator in our relationship with Him. That may come as a, so a shock to some of you. God is the, is the initiator in our relationship with Him. It's God, not people. He is the creator. We are His created. We did not create him. He created us. From the very beginning of time, God initiated our relationship with him. When we look at the creation event in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we discover God created everything to his glory because he's God. That he might delight in his creation. It's like God is the master artist who creates for his own glory. Like a person planting a, a garden full of flowers and fruit. You know, John Wesley did that. Had a little peace garden that he planted outside his place in London. I've seen it. It's beautiful. Walk out there and work in the garden and step back from it and admire it and smile and say, Oh, look, this is wonderful. A person walks into the garden and admires what they've done with a smile on their face thinking, This is nice, like a secret garden. It's beautiful. That's why God created all of this, to delight in it. Why would God create, we ask? Simply to admire what he has created. Because he is God. More complex than our human mind can comprehend when we look at the, the little 
intricacies of the things that he created. It overwhelms us that God would create. Who can know the mind of the Lord? Or who's been his counselor, Scripture tells us. God is so far beyond us, even in the creation. We look at it superficially and see his natural world and go, Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's pretty. But we have no idea of what it takes to make this what it is. But God created it. He created it all for his delight. But then came people. God created the highest form of sensate beings. People. To go beyond just delight in a created thing. Oh, this is wonderful. Oh, it's pretty. It's nice. And then he created people. God wanted something different with people. He wanted something very unique and very special with people. God wanted to fellowship. He wanted companionship with people. He does not have what he has with people with anything else in all of creation. Nothing else can fellowship with God like people. He says, oh, that's nice, that's beautiful, that's pretty, I can appreciate it. But he has relationship and fellowship with people. He breathed his breath into people, only people, giving them a soul, a spirit that nothing else he had created ever had. So that he, God, could actually commune with us. It's a spirit thing. And God can actually commune with us. It's something very unique to us, something unlike anything previous that he had created. And that act, God initiated in that act relationship, relationship with us, something not experienced by anything else ever. When Adam and Eve walked in the cool of the day, we read, it was in fellowship and in perfect communion with God. Can you imagine? And then when Adam sinned, he, not God, broke that fellowship, giving all of us the seed of sin that continues to break fellowship with God. All have sinned, we're told. And therefore, all have broken the fellowship and communion God originally intended. It was God who called out in the garden, Adam, where are you? Something is gone. Something has happened, and something is missing. Something is lost. Fellowship. Fellowship with God. Communion. A relationship had been broken. Adam did not look for God. Adam, where are you? I was hiding, Lord. I lost this radiance. I lost something terribly. What have you done, Adam? He tried to hide from God. God looked for and sought out a broken and fallen Adam. This continues throughout time. God initiates our relationship with him. He goes looking for us first. Sometimes we really get that messed up. Under the recommendation of Daniel to the king, he says, renounce your sin by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may, then, that, it may be that then your prosperity will continue. I said last week, God prospers us. He blesses us materially when we walk with him. God initiates. He gets the person's attention. He makes things uncomfortable for the person who has wandered from him. Because God wants, he longs for, fellowship and communion with people. God could have easily crushed King Nebuchadnezzar, but instead he used radical things to get the attention of this king who was so haughty and so into himself. So then the question might be for us here this morning, what does God do to get your attention? Something? Anything? What might he have to do to get your attention? God will go to all lengths to get you to simply acknowledge him as your God. Listen, can you hear him calling? God wants your attention. He initiates the relationship. Secondly, we see from this passage and the timeless truths that are therein, God is the restorer of a broken relationship with him. Not only is it God that initiates the relationship, he also restores a broken relationship with him. 
People so often put things in their own court. I did this, or I made a decision, or I spoke about my need. But in the book of Daniel, it tells us that many times things are out of the hands or out of our control, and that God is there in those times. He initiates the, our relationship. He woos us into fellowship him, with him. And when we wander, he restores us. I'll struggle till the day I die with this dichotomy that goes on in our thinking between the sovereignty of God and the free will of people. So often we make it all about people, their will, their decision, their return to God. But please do not forget that it was God and is always God who had the plan in the first place. He sent Jesus as the repair and the restorer of our broken relationship with him. When we stumble and fall away, God calls and calls and moves and places people and situations in our lives to draw us back to him. There's not a person here that wouldn't be here today if other people hadn't spoken into your life the hope that comes from knowing Jesus. We may walk away saying, I made a decision today, but never forget it was God's plan in the first place. Aren't you glad we serve a restoring God? Praise the Lord for that. Forgive me, Lord. No, forget it. You messed up. You're done. Praise God that's not the God we serve. God forgives. And he restores. How many times does he restore us? You know, they went to with Jesus with that question. The law says seven times. Jesus says, 70 times seven. Or Endless. That's the way God works. We fall down, God lifts us up. But then we fall down again. God lifts us up again. Why? Because he loves us and wants us in fellowship with him. In the book of Daniel, while his people were living outside his plan in the foreign land, God's plan, in a foreign land under an oppressive ruler. See, they were very stubborn. God still wanted to show his people that he loved them. He wanted to restore them once again, so he said, I'm going to take you out of the land. You know, you, you're living in all this prosperity and you're living in sin. I'm going to pull it away from you. The plan was, well, how long, God? How long, the prophet said? Seventy years. Wow, seventy again. Must be something to that number. You'll be out for seventy years. You know the only person who came back? Daniel. For some of us, it takes a while, doesn't it? King Nebuchadnezzar had bowed at the feet of Daniel in the interpretation of the first dream. He bowed to the feet of Daniel and said, Wow, your God is God. Then he builds a golden altar to worship some other small God. How does that work? You just acknowledge he was God. Well, yeah, then I'll build this over here. And he sees a miracle of the fourth man in the fiery furnace and cries, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, your God is God. And then he falls to the pride of all he owns and is accomplished. Look what I've done. I'm the man. So God lets him lose his mind until Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges God as God once again. God restores us to relationship with him. We serve a restoring God. So let's look at another application. Where are you? Have you wandered away? Have you stumbled and fallen? Have you fallen to the pride of personal accomplishments? Look at me. I'm successful. Have you lost your mind? Lift your eyes to the heavens and once again acknowledge God as the only true God. He restores his people. We serve a restoring God. Which leads us to the last point. God initiates. God restores. But we must recognize and acknowledge God. That's our part. God has his part, and we have our part. There's that dichotomy again. The sovereignty of God and the free will of man. Any relationship is only a relationship when it goes both ways. Listen carefully to that, those of you that are in relationships. Any relationship is only a relationship when it goes both ways. If it does not go both ways, it is not a relationship. It's a dictation. 
we're to have a relationship with God, we have to acknowledge God for who He is. He alone is God, the uncreated creator of all things, the creator of time and space, before all, and He will be after all, the real master of the universe. When Job acknowledged God as God, he was restored. When King Nebuchadnezzar looked up at the skies and acknowledged God as God, he was restored. When we acknowledge God as God, we become restored in relationship with Him as well. We are then set back on the perfect track of life, of the life that God has for us. We live and move in the center of His will for us at that point. We're no longer shooting at some outer circle of the target looking for where the bullseye has wandered off to. With that center of God's will comes a peace that goes beyond comprehension. With that center of God's will comes a joy of living the abundant life. Life beyond the mundane and the routine of mediocrity. We get excited about life. And the greatest of all, when you're in the center of God's will, you experience love, true love, love that comes from knowing the truth, love that is for people from God. So have you done your part? Have you recognized and acknowledged God as God? Are you living in the center of his will for you right now? He initiates the relationship. He restores the relationship when we wander. He never wanders. We wander, and we embrace the relationship by recognizing and acknowledging God as God, the one true God, the only one. Have you done that? Maybe you're not where you should be. Maybe you've wandered from where you once were with him. Maybe you've not even begun your journey with him, and you'd like to start in your faith journey. It's as simple as a prayer away. And that simple decision to start with him. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Oh Lord, we've heard an incredible message and incredible truths that come from Daniel chapter 4, one of the most prophetic books ever written. And a book that was inspired by you, written in a foreign language that we might have some timeless truths that will apply to our lives today. Father God, forgive us where we have not known you and where we have not acknowledged you. Help us, Lord, to walk in the light that you give us. You initiate this relationship between us, even in moments like this, when you call upon your people to recognize and acknowledge you. You've placed us in this place to hear this message for these moments, for such a time as this. In the middle of these elections when we're all confused about the truths and untruths and who's saying what and who to vote for and what to do and who's going to be overseeing us, that we're reminded from Daniel chapter 4 that you set those people in place, God, because you're God. Sometimes it's easy to forget that, so help us with that. You initiate that relationship with each and every one of us. And then what we seem to like the most about knowing who you are is that you restore us in relationship. You not only initiate it, you restore us. And when we stumble and we fall and we get off track, you pick us up and place our feet on the solid rock. You pick us up and put us back in line with you on that track that we might be able to walk the walk of faith by accepting you as the light that gives us light in this faith journey. We're all on a journey. Every one of us is in different places, but God, in these moments, if you have someone here that needs to be restored, we pray that they might just open their heart to you now and embrace the truth that you are truly God. And for those who, Lord, maybe have never even started on their faith journey yet, that this might be the starting point. So we pray that as you speak to the hearts of your people, you might just, Lord, allow that person to open their hearts 
to saying, yes, I'll try this darn thing. And then, Lord, that each one of us would be mindful of our part, that we do need to surrender ourselves. We need to open our hands. We need to let go and let you, God, be God. So, Father, this morning, even as we look at this Daniel chapter 4 and the crazy story of King Nebuchadnezzar going wild, that we might see that, yes, that may have happened to us as well. And we need to be back in relationship with you. So speak to the hearts of your people and give them that surrendered heart that they might know you truly as their God. Well, thank you for all that you do through us, to us, and among us. In Jesus' name.